Okay, so you know all about why you should do it, you've prioritized, you've found a spot, now how do you do it? First, I, I was asked to speak a little bit about programs. Um, I will just say there's a ton of programs that would support buffer implementation on all different types of land use. There's a lot of different types of federal programs and then all the federal federal bureaucracy that comes with those programs. There's a lot of different types of state programs and again then you deal with state bureaucracy but maybe it's a little bit easier than federal bureaucracy. Um, but a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities for farmers to enroll in federal programs. Um, it, it would be nice if they had an advocate to help them through the program and a lot of the time soil and water act, uh, acts as that advocate. But anyways, it, it's a long process to be enrolled in a federal program. Um, but a lot of those programs do um, potentially offer incentives, sign-on bonuses, rental rate, you know, per year they get X amount of dollars. There's a lot of great things about the federal programs if you get through the bureaucracy. Uh, state programs, again, whole host of programs depending on the land use and your potential issue on the land. Uh, and then there's also the Trees for Tributaries program that I will touch on briefly a little bit later. Um, in my neck of the woods, we have a whole host of programs that we will also you know, help support buffer implementation. Um, and we try to make them very streamlined and easy to access. And we also work to fill any type of gap that's present between any federal and state program as well. <clears throat> there are a lot of different types of program components. How much cost share do they provide? Is the landowner solely responsible for funding the buffer implementation? Who's paying for it? How much are they paying? Are there programmatic incentives? Is there other money on the table that helps pay for it? Sign on bonuses, et cetera. What are the requirements for buffer implementation? Is there a width requirement? Is there a species requirement? Is there a type of plant requirement? Typically there is. Is there a protective materials requirement? Typically there is. Is there a maintenance requirement? Yes. Some of these components are cumbersome to people enrolling in the program. Okay, so we're gonna forget about the programs and we're just gonna talk about how do we actually physically implement the buffer, what do we plan for? <clears throat> First of all, we always take into consideration landowner goals, that's why we are probably on their property in the first place is because there's an issue that a landowner would like to address and they have some goal in mind for their potential project. So at the end of the day, we're going to have to find a funding source that meets their goals. That's what's driving the project. And with all of the programs and planning, there are experts. We have Tompkins County Soil and Water Conservation District. They are an expert in these programs and buffer implementation. The Upper Susquehanna Coalition, we are experts. And then there's also other multidisciplinary agency folks around that can help as well, such as the folks here tonight. So first of all, I'm gonna go through just some of the components that we talk about, some you know, planning considerations that we talk about once a landowner is committed to implementing a buffer of an unknown width, okay? Yes, I want plants planted next to my stream. What are the next steps? As a planner, you know, I talk with the landowner about what they want in their buffer. Do you want edible plants? Do you want habitat? What do you want to see in your buffer? Do you want a gap here with no trees so you can look through to the other side? You know, all of those considerations. Once we agree on the type of plants that you need and would like, what type of protective measures do we use? What do we tube? What do we put tree tubes on? There are five foot tubes and also there are shrub tubes. I would never go anything less than a five foot tube for trees and then I, in, my, in our neck of the woods, we support tubing everything. You know, you put a bare root plant in the ground, you put a shrub tube on it, you know, it's gonna help that little plant at least establish roots before the deer browse it, all right? So I like to tube everything. <clears throat> I even tube conifers, at least for the first year or two. Um, if there's no landowner maintenance being performed and the grasses are gonna grow up, come winter, they're all gonna fall down and we call that death by lodging. They're gonna basically crush that little plant. 
So tube it. It's just a little seedling. It can survive being tubed for one to two years. It's okay. It may not have the form that everybody wants it to have, but it's okay. You know, what type of tube would you like to see? And what type of maintenance comes with a tube? Um, <clears throat> so here, this is like a netted tube. I hate these because look, look at how much maintenance is involved in taking one tube off of a plant. Ugh. You have to be cautious about the type of tube you have, making sure there's proper ventilation. There's many, many different types of tubes out there. If there's not proper ventilation, you're gonna get algae and moss and maybe some undesirable things happening to your trees. And then again, um, just here, I, this is actually a dogwood that was in a five foot tube. It was put here by a volunteer, so a mistake. But this is where, basically this was the only shrub that survived one of my plantings. And we were like, oh my God, it was in a tube. We're tubing everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are a couple different types of tubes that people like, four foot versus five foot. Always get the five foot. The four foot are, they're too small. The trees pop out the top, the deer will get them. The five foot, we have pretty good success with that. The tree tubes also help protect against a variety of other things, not just the deer. They protect from herbicide drift in a lot of the larger plantings. Uh, landowners will apply herbicide, especially if there's invasive and noxious species there. You need to apply herbicide to take care of that. They protect against any sort of drift. Um, so any, any deer or anybody else that's coming along deciding to lean into it, um, reduce mechanical damage, even if they're not applying herbicide and they're mowing up and down the rows of trees, it's nice to have a tube. It protects the plant from mowers, from weed whackers, stuff like that. Uh, lateral branch suppression, just so it grows nice and straight for a little while. Reduce trunk tapering and lower water stress. These tubes now are very sophisticated, it seems. They make a nice little environment for your tree. And I put seedlings, sycamore seedlings, that are maybe six inches in height in the ground, and three years later, they're eight feet tall. It's the tube. <laughs> so tree shelters, protected versus unprotected. Uh, basically, this, the, this is from um, some Stroud Water Research, Stroud Water Research Institute research. Basically what we're saying here is that tree shelters um, lead to more survivability and faster growth than unprotected seedlings. So seedlings with tree shelters grew 21 times faster than unsheltered seedlings. And they're not just growing like straight up without any girth, they definitely have girth as well. It's a very nice um, system. Weed mats, um, you know, this is something that a lot of other, that a lot of programs require. They require a weed mat. There are multiple different kinds. This mat here is called a Vizpor weed mat, and it is a type of plastic. There's also coconut fiber weed mats. I find all types of weed mats to be relatively ineffective, or maybe they're effective for a growing season, and that's it. Tube everything, save your money, tube them, don't mat them. You know, so af this is after, you know, I plant in spring, comes winter, everything falls on it, I come back next spring to check, this is what I'm pulling off of a mat. So it was literally effective for one season, and these are photodegradable, and if they're not getting any sun, they're not going to degrade. So this is just essentially what's sitting underneath and that just doesn't sit well with me. That's why I personally don't recommend them in many situations. They definitely have applicability in some cases, but for the most part, they're cumbersome to implement and then they don't really prove to be all that effective, especially if you want to save your money and just tube everything. Matt, uh, sometimes the question is, can you actually get the staples in? Coconut fiber mats, getting a staple in there is difficult. Um, obviously, a two-year-old cannot do it, but um, like you need a hammer, right? That's a lot. And then sometimes you just can't put a weed mat down because the, your site's all rock. I also firmly believe that mats create nice little environments for meadow voles. Uh, another reason why I don't like to put them down, but if you have voles present on site, you've seen them, you see their damage, then you got a whole another host of problems you have to address before you start putting little baby trees in there. Stakes. 
I recommend putting stakes on every single plant, even if you're not tubing everything, you wanna come back, you wanna see if your trees lived, your shrubs lived the next year, or maybe even later in the summer, right? The grass is high, stake everything, right? The stakes aren't all that expensive, just put a stake in there so you can come back, check your survivability of your project. So lesson one, plan for site conditions. Our planning considerations are what types of supplemental materials are we gonna have? What are our site conditions? What are the soils? How flashy is the stream? What's the stream look like? We need to know stream conditions. And then site prep needs. We need to know where's the access and are other practices needed. Here's just kind of a layout of a site. We walk a site and we determine, you know, all the different types of planting, plant communities that we want on site. It doesn't have to be this complicated, right? You could be like, I have dogwood, willow, and sycamore. Let's put them there. If the site conditions allow for it, just do it. It doesn't have to be this complicated if you have the stock already, but this, we had quite a bit of foresight in this so we could plan accordingly. So we have a nice layout, we have our access points, there's our species composition list for all the different areas that we've identified, you know, our windbreak areas, our flood tolerant species areas, our small trees, and our shrubs. Are there other project needs before we plant the buffer? Do we need to remo remove or replace culverts? Are there stream bank stabilization issues? Are there head cuts? You know, things that we need to address before we go ahead and plant plants. Those need to be addressed first. Buffers go in when you're pulling out of a project. Lesson two, site prep. All sites need it, um, you know, and they could be mowed. All sites can use site prep. If you're doing containerized stock and you have a big project, you need to auger the holes if you have volunteers. Um, sorry, that threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mowing, uh, in this case, you know, we needed to do several rounds of herbicide application, so planting this area is at least a year or two out. Uh, so you need a timeline and you need to determine your site prep needs, who's going to do it, what size equipment do they have, how do they access the site. Here, uh, this was the same layout that I showed you just a bit ago. Uh, we had containerized stock here. We had an access point that we were able to get a mower in. We put the fence in first to exclude all the cattle from the stream, and then we went in and we mowed areas, came back through with um, this piece of equipment and augered the holes. And who's augering your holes? Is it the guy who put the fence in? Who is it? Like, do they know that you're planting plants that are in a container that's only a foot deep? We do not need three foot holes. Do they know the spacing of the holes? You need to go through maybe the site first and you need to put paint marks everywhere a plant is gonna go. You know, you, or in this case, I painted, I went through and I painted every location that a plant was gonna go and then we still had somebody there pointing to those spots to say, dig here dig here, you know, and you're going too deep. You're not going deep enough. So here's prep. Uh, if you're doing a volunteer planting, we still have to, you know, lay out the materials. We have to have everything really laid out as simple as possible. So here I had buckets of different types of plants and on each bucket I had a label and I'll just read one to you. Here, this is zone one and I had them laid out on the property. Zone one, not directly next to stream, no shrub tubes. And then I listed the species that are present in there. You know, so I have the type of species, where you're putting it, and what type of supplemental material or protective material goes on the plant. If you're doing a volunteer planting, this is what needs to be done. These are professionals <laughs> we've hired to come out on site and do projects. They need no guidance. They basically go through with, you know, and mark everything themselves. They have tape that's, you know, hundreds of feet long and marked with flagging every 15 feet or every 12 feet or every 20 feet, whatever spacing you want your plants. Another volunteer planting site, we laid out the plant, the mat, and the tube and the stake next to every single spot that we wanted a plant. Same thing here. So it was easy for volunteers to come through and do the work that they need to do. 
Lesson three, we need to secure planters. Who is actually going to put this in? You know, I don't know the size projects you have in mind, but you know, if you're planting probably more than 100 plants, you're gonna need more than just you and your spouse or child. <laughs> you know, you're gonna need someone to come along and help you. So you need to secure planters. I love hiring planting contractors. It makes life so much better. They know what they're doing, they do a good job. And then for years to come, you have less site maintenance because you've made that initial investment. They put the tubes in correctly, they put them into the ground, the stake goes far into the ground, they're strong people, they do it all day long, it's great. But volunteers are also great, they smile, they chat, they, you know, it's, you know, they're good, good fuzzy feelings, you know. And I like how my last technician said, and make sure they can plant a tree. A lot of volunteers do not know how to plant trees. You know, we have roots sticking out instead of the tips. You need to teach them beforehand. Plan for this, teach them how to plant a tree, considerable much more time spent on volunteers. Feed, feed your volunteers. Um, happy volunteers equals a successful project. Question. Yeah. Those yes. Makes it easy for maintenance. Boring. Boring makes it easy for maintenance. Makes it so the landowner might actually do maintenance. You make it too hard, maintenance is not getting done. Again, here's my professionals. They show up, they have all the materials. Whenever we do volunteer projects, I get the materials. I lug the materials to the site. I lay out the materials. It takes two days of me prepping the site for a volunteer event. When it's a contractor that I hire, I say, I want these plants and I want them to be this big. I want these tubes, you bring it all. I show up when they show up, I make sure they have what we want and then they go to work. Lovely. <laughs> Lesson four, if you're doing a volunteer planting, uh, post, post planting, sweep your site for tools and unplanted areas. <clears throat> Lesson five, plan for and perform maintenance. Keep track of survival. These are volunteer planted areas. You need to go back every single year and perform maintenance. Tubes fall. Um, and so your trees are growing wonky, you need to perform maintenance, especially on volunteer planted areas. It is essential. Um, and keep track of survival, very important. That way you know, do I need to go back and do a replant? A, a successful project equals a forested area, right? If you don't have a forested area, you do not have a riparian forest buffer. So you need to keep track of survival so you can ensure that the area will be forested, that there will be canopy cover. Management tips, you need to provide landowner with checklists, maintenance calendars, emails, phone calls, whatever you need to do to make sure that the landowner is aware of their maintenance requirements for this area. You need to hold their hand. <clears throat> And last, I'll just talk to you quick about a few projects. Um, this, and yeah, I actually have two projects here and they both were performed using the Trees for Tributaries program. This is probably the easiest program to utilize. In the Upper Sus watershed, the coalition, myself, we coordinate the program, but if you're outside the watershed, you have to deal directly with the state for funding. But it is a very simple program. The program provides materials, any type of material you may want, plants, and technical assistance typically you can get by DEC personnel or Soil and Water Conservation District personnel. There is an application. It is a front and back piece of paper. The front has project you know, information. Who's the landowner? How big is it? How many trees do you need? Pretty simple stuff. The back of it, basically just requires a landowner signature. It's a beautiful application. There are a few requirements. You cannot plant on FEMA buyout lots. Um, you may not be able to plant on a pond or a lake that does not have a distinct outlet on site. And you cannot plant on the opposite side of the road. All from personal experience. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna skip right through this, but <clears throat> again, I just want to point out, you can get all different types of materials. The tree tubes, you can get, I buy foot and a half shrub tubes. You can get 
vis pour mats, you can get coconut fiber mats, you can get short stakes, you can get tall stakes, you can get basically anything you want through this program. You just provide them your budget. To show you a little bit about what we've done with the program over the years since we started with it in 2016, um, we have requested, you know, the first year, a lot of plants, and then we had, we still had those plants the next year, so, <laughs> but, um, so we're kind of leveling off and we're trying to only get 5,000 plants per year, but what I really want to show you is the number of plants per project. 300 plants is about an acre and a half of riparian buffer. The projects that we implement using this program are small. Some of them are big, some of them are 20 plants, but typically they're, they're pretty manageable for a volunteer not big enough to solicit a contractor. So like I said, we have a lot of project diversity with this program, small projects. You know, we worked with the Finger Lakes Land Trust to do a 20 plant project. Um, you know, we've also accompanied this program with a larger project with exclusion fence, grazing, and wetland enhancement. Um, some of the projects just have shrubs. Some just have trees. You know, there are no pro species requirements for the program. It's very flexible. This is Hickory's Park in Owego. We planted it in 2016 using very, very tiny, tiny Saratoga nursery stock. Uh, we laid it out and we planted it probably way too late. It was the beginning of June. We had uh, park interns, I guess they're called, who helped as well as some interns that I had secured plant this project. You know, I did not think it was gonna go well just because it was really late. We needed to get a bunch of, bunch of plants in the ground, but this is three years later. This was just this summer. Three plus acres of riparian buffer, and this is little, little Nanakoke Creek right here. The real reason why the park wanted to do this project was because this is three and a half acres that they don't have to mow, right? So they did mow it though for the first three years. They mowed up and down those rows. It was easy for them. Their interns could do it, right? All you gotta do, up the row, down, don't hit the tube. Up the row, down the row. That's it, that's all you gotta do, and that's what they did. And it's really led to a successful project. Now, after this summer, I said, you don't need to do this anymore. This is fine, the trees are established, they're way beyond the grass, just leave it alone. They're so happy. <clears throat> this is what it looked like in 2018. We had a lot of, you know, this is why you have to perform maintenance, right? The zip ties broke, we had to come back, reattach the tube to the stake, make sure the stake was in the ground. Um, this is the type of girth that we were getting on some of those six inch tall seedlings that we implemented. This is a catalpa tree, uh, you know, maybe not people's favorite at the moment, but this was teeny tiny when we planted it. Three years later, it's, that's a five foot tube. So 12 feet tall. And today, we're finding a lot of different types of wildlife there present on site. We tube the conifers, um, and this is what they look like. I think they look great, you know, maybe a little floppy, but they're alive and they're taller than the grass. And those tubes that we used were called miracle tubes, and they did not provide great ventilation, so we did have a few trees that may perish due to mold and algae. And that's all, I can go into another project, but I think maybe I should stop because I don't have any time left. Yeah.